Good morning, everybody. Um, as you know, I don't know much, but I know at least one thing that you don't know, and that is I know how much more of this liturgy there is yet to come. And so, because of all of that that is coming, I am going to keep this pretty short, and you had better pay attention if you don't want to miss it. You ready? Here we go. All of us with any experience of the church know at least a couple of things about the first Sunday after Easter Day. We know that nobody is expected to come to church. We fix that by having 10 people confirmed. <laughs> and we know there is at least one lesson we are sure to hear this morning, right? Because always on the first Sunday after Easter we hear the story of the Apostle Thomas. One of the dangers of that predictability, the fact that we come here knowing we're going to hear about doubting Thomas, is that we hear that story, but do not listen. It just kind of glances right off of us because we know how it goes, right? It is Sunday. The apostles are gathered together. It's church. But Thomas is not there. Jesus comes. It's exciting. He leaves. Finally, Thomas rejoins them, and the other disciples tell Thomas what has happened. He doesn't believe them. And he says this critical line, this line so familiar to our own experience of faith, unless I see, unless I see, I will not believe. And so later, when Thomas is there, Jesus returns again, and Thomas sees and believes, and then Jesus teaches them and teaches all of us something about the importance of believing without seeing. We know all of that, right? Is that all there is to this story? In a book published just last year, a book that he finished during COVID time, the theologian David Ford calls that story around Thomas in that moment a God-sized event. A God-sized event. Do we really hear it like a God-sized event? And then Ford goes on to say this, the theological essence of the whole resurrection and the whole gospel is encapsulated here in this story involving the body of Jesus, God, and faith. Wow. Maybe there is something more here that we ought to pay attention to. Sisters and brothers, we could spend a very profitable hour just exploring the meaning of this story and the way it reveals the whole theology of John's gospel, but we cannot do that today. We all have brunch reservations. So here's the one thing I want you to hang on to. It is that word, unless, unless I see. Because all of the other disciples had that first experience, right? And Thomas did not. So it's only from Thomas that we ever hear that word. But that hardly means the other disciples were any more faithful. Yeah? We don't know how they would have reacted if they hadn't been in that room on that first Sunday. Maybe they had an unless. Don't you suppose Peter, of all people, would have had an unless? We have all just been through the drama of Holy Week and the joy of Easter. We have had all that the church can offer us to renew and restore us in our faith. And yet, and yet, there is still a war in Ukraine. People are still dying from COVID. There are still refugees right here among us in Geneva seeking help and safety, vulnerable to persecution and trafficking, and subjected to racist hate here and in countries across Europe. Does any of that give you an unless? Unless I see that God's love really does make a difference in the world, I will not believe. Unless I see that the hearts of the people who are making this bloody war can be transformed 
in some way, I will not believe. Unless I am sure that my Christian faith won't get me suspicious looks from my neighbors or harm my professional prospects, I will not believe unless I know that influencers are making Christianity cool again. I won't believe. What's your unless? What's your condition, your test? The people around us, the people who pass by this place while we gather here for worship, they have a lot of unless. Maybe they are Thomas. Maybe if they saw the body of the risen Jesus, if they heard him talking and saw him acting in the world, maybe then they would believe. But friends, that is who we are. That is who we are supposed to be. We are the body of Christ, raised, remembered, alive, wounded, yes, Rejected? Yes. Misunderstood? Oh, yes. But alive. We are the answer to the world's unless. We are the presence of God's love that intends to accept, include, forgive, reconcile, restore. But we can only be that answer, that presence, if we act in faith and not in fear. There are two true things about Thomas's story that are just as true for us today. The first is that those apostles who have that experience of Jesus' presence among them testify to their experience, and their testimony is true. It is a truth that stands against all doubt. What they told to Thomas, what we tell the world, is true. That Jesus is the presence of God in this world. The only God, the God who is love and intends to love us back into the people we were intended to be. Not the, world, not the people the world thinks we're supposed to be. And here is the second thing that is true. Thomas missed the first opportunity to hear this truth. Why? Because he wasn't in church. <laughs> Hearing the truth about God means making and keeping a commitment to be among God's people, to be a part of the fragile, frustrating, loving, graceful communities that we are meant to make together. Friends, the bishop is not your teacher this morning. I am just here to tell you what to pay attention to. Your teachers this morning are ten young people who stand among you as Christians who no longer have an unless. They have no conditions. They place no qualifications. They are all in. They believed the truth they found here in the church. They listened to your testimony about God's living, healing presence in the world right here, right now, and they believed you. And unlike Thomas, they showed up in church. They're here, showing up in church today. Whatever happens next, they don't want to miss it. And so they are here, and by the confession they make today, they are telling you that they intend to stay. At the end of Thomas' story, we have that response he gives to that unimaginable moment when he gets his wish and sees his friend alive. What does he say? My Lord and my God. When Thomas says that, remember, 
that he is echoing the very first assertion in the whole Gospel of John, the very first claim in the story. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. At the end of the story, it is the voice of Thomas, doubting Thomas, that brings that whole story to its completion. But remember this. Do you know who else people referred to in that way in Jesus' day? Who else expected the people around them to regard them as Lord and God? The emperor, the man in Rome with all the power and all the military and all the violence, or at least what he thought was power. When Thomas says those words, my Lord and my God, he is doing more than stating a truth. He is starting a movement. He is becoming the first revolutionary. He is saying that the powers of this world have no claim on him higher than the God who lived and died and was raised in Christ. My friends, be in no doubt that there are leaders in our world today who demand to be regarded as Lord and God who demand authority over every aspect of human life, not over just their people's hopes, not over just their people's bodies, but over their beliefs, over their conscience. To be a Christian in places like that today is to be a dangerous person because it is to claim a kind of freedom given by God that can never be taken away or controlled by any powers of this world. It is to say that our primary source of identity lies not in our nationality, not in our ethnicity, not in our race or our language or anything else, but in our baptism, in our being part of the body of Christ. Be in no doubt that there are leaders determined to shut that dangerous possibility down completely today. Before you stand ten people who know all of that and despite all of that have no unless, no conditions, how about you? Will you follow their example? May God grant that by Christ dwelling in you, you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen.